Are you interested in knowing what is yours? Because unless you are sure, the enemy will fight. He will contest. And that's why the Bible says without faith, it's impossible. Faith is the confidence. It's the assurance of the things we hope for. It's that confidence that what I hope for, I will get. Being sure, it's the evidence. That is what faith is. The number one thing about the blessing is that it gives us salvation. There's no blessing without forgiveness of sin. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. I want you to understand, a blessed life is not just rich spiritually, a blessed life is also rich materially. A blessed life is not just rich materially, there's no blessing in just material things. The blessing is when the two collide in a life, that person is productive, that person has a testimony. And so if you are going to be a blessed person, you are going to be one person that seeks after God. And I want to just uh, talk more on the practical side of blessing, uh, what exactly is contained in the blessing. It's not different or strange uh, to hear a message on blessing uh, in our circles, uh, in the church today, all over the internet. Everyone uh, today is talking about blessing here, blessing there. Um, what I found is that many times, we talk about things in the spiritual realm, we cannot clearly articulate, we cannot explain what it is. If you st stop there, just an ordinary Christian, and you stop them and you say, hey, can you tell me what the blessing is? What has Jesus uh, blessed you with? What have you been given? What's your inheritance in Christ? What is it when you say blessing, what do you mean in practical terms? Many people cannot actually give a direct answer. What I want to try and do today is to give a list or uh, just like an itemized, it's not exhaustive in any way. There's no way we can exhaust all the blessings, but I want to itemize and begin you on a journey to where you are going to be whenever you see a blessing that is meant for you or whenever you see any item in the blessing of God that is directed for you, you'll be able to identify it and when you know it, you can claim it. The people of God perish or they go through troubles because of lack of knowledge. And we also know that we develop faith by hearing the word. If I know what is mine, I'll have faith for it. If I do not know what is mine, I will not have faith for it. And so I want to just spend uh, some time and discuss uh, what exactly is in the blessing and my hope is that at the end of this message, if I don't finish on the items that I have here, I'm going to post this on our notes on the app. So we have been uh, uh, tracking and walking with this young man, Jacob, and Jacob has come to our land. Uh, he has lived in the family of his uncle, uh, Laban, and he marries uh, two of his cousins from, uh, from his mother's side. Uh, those days that was acceptable. Uh, nowadays that is probably uh, not going to be acceptable. But he actually did that and married those two. And uh, Leah and Rachel, and he, he, was, he raised a family, stayed there for a long time. I've been, I've been trying to look be, behind uh, the, this man's beliefs, behind this man's faith. What exactly is it that caused this man, Jacob, be blessed while other people have walked the face of the earth, lived a whole lifetime, and not experienced the blessing, yet they were born again, and yet they qualify, and yet in heaven, they are blessed with all heavenly blessings. And I've, I've wanted to pursue this, and I, I've come back to the Holy Spirit, and I said, show me something else. Show me something. Show me the things that are not obvious to us, that we have failed to see over the years, and one of the things that I have been taught over the years by God is that this man had the faith or the confidence. It sounds simple, but he had the confidence in the blessing of God. And one of the studies that I've done with the children of Israel, even today, the Israelites today, the Jews are blessed wherever they are. And one of the things is that they have this confidence in them. And I remember talking about that one of the afternoons that I've shared here in the church, that it is a confidence that they have, that they are blessed, and that the blessing of Abraham is theirs. It's not just that the Abraham's blessing is theirs, it's not that they sing the songs that that blessing is theirs, but it is the kind of confidence that they do have, that they are blessed, 
And wherever they go, they are going to prosper. That is actually what can be attributed to what actually is now one of the most blessed ethnicity or group of people in the world. Their blessing can be attributed to the fact that they have this confidence. And Jacob, when he's leaving his father's house, Isaac's house, goes and meets God somewhere in the way. He goes to this land and he lives there for a whole 14 years, not having accomplished anything. The blessed man. He's there in a fallen land, and in this land, all he has done in these 14 years is marry and then have children. There's nothing else that can, of course, he's able to feed himself. Of course, he has a few sheep and goats here and there. Of course, this man has a few things that he can show, but this man is not experiencing a blessing after 14 years. He's just about to encounter a big blessing for seven years that it's hard for him to contain it. Until God says, now, whatever I wanted to do with your life here is done. Now move back and go back to Bethel where I met you so that you can fulfill your promise uh, to me when you get there. He had confidence. For the first 14 years, this man was not awake. I think, I don't know what he was dealing with. But all this time, he had because when Laban came and called him and he said, hey, What can I give you? He said, I want to go back home. I've done nothing for myself. I've already paid for these wives. The only thing I've been able to do is pay you dowry and have children. I want to go and do something for myself. The father-in-law says to him, what shall I give you? Just name your price and stay here and work for me. That means, oh, Jacob, (laughs) I'm a wealthy man. Let me bless him. And Jacob answers him very quickly in Genesis 30, 31. And what he says is, uh, don't give me anything. That's what he says. First statement is, don't give me anything. Can you imagine a person that is in a fallen land, doesn't have much, talking to a wealthy man and saying, don't give me anything. I don't want any gift from you. This is a person that has confidence that even though you don't see me with material blessings now, I have a confidence in me that those things that God spoke about my life are mine and I'm going to experience them in my lifetime. And so what I want to just uh, encourage all of us is and what I want to do with today's message is kind of build confidence in you that these blessings are yours. You can be a partaker. You can walk in these blessings and these blessings can become your portion. And I want you to experience them. Ephesians chapter one. I'm going to go there. Verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us. He has already blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I want you to know that the person who, who wrote this was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he did not just write words that we can just for us to read. These words have meaning. We have been blessed. There's something called blessing that has been done to us. And he talks about every. That means there's nothing else to do with this blessing. It's perfect, cannot be improved, cannot be increased. The blessing that God has already blessed me with spiritually cannot be added to. It cannot be added to. It's perfect. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. I'll say this, and I I want you to don't take offense to it. If you have blessings, but you cannot experience them, what word are they to you? You have blessings, but you are sleeping hungry. You have blessings, but you are not, you are always confessing sin. You are always confessing sin. You never feel like you are forgiven, yet God has already forgiven you. What value is it? And actually, Ecclesiastes 11 verse 9, the Bible says, A band in the hand is worth two in the bush. Mere dreaming of nice things is foolish, is chasing the wind. That means, I would rather not have uh, two birds out there. I would rather have one that I can hold with my hand. And he says, it's chasing after the wind. It's foolish. It's chasing uh, the wind. If you have two, and that, that, that's so many blessings that we talk about. And we are, this, we are confessing, and it's true. We have been given these blessings. Experiencing them is what I want you to have. The experience of the blessing of God. If it's a spiritual blessing, it's forgiveness of sin. If it's enjoying the presence of God, if it's a Holy Spirit, these are things you ought to experience. If it's financial material blessing, they are yours also. They are not unholy. They are holy. This art was created by God and God did not create any unholy things. It's also a blessing that he gave to those who served him. 
I want you to understand that these blessings are things that God has already spoken and God has already promised to give to us. And these are things that we should experience and we should walk in the power uh, thereof. And so let us experience what this blessing contains. The blessing actually is contained in a document that is called the will or the testament. The will or the testament and we talk about the New Testament and the Old Testament. We talk about the New Covenant or the Old Covenant. If in today's language, because we don't use the language of Testament and Covenants, we talk the language of will. Will is, uh, I think, the language that applies more to us. And uh, you know that Jesus has a will. He died. Before he died, he said, this is what I'm going to uh, leave to all my children, all my brothers. Those who come into the kingdom, I'm a heir of a kingdom, and what I'm going to leave to them, they cannot understand, they cannot get it now. He actually told them, I cannot teach you all things now because you won't get it, but I'll send you the Holy Spirit. He's going to teach you all things so that you can have an understanding of those things. And so when the uh, Holy Spirit, our teacher has come, what is he teaching us? He's not teaching us to know God. What he's teaching us is to know our inheritance. Because the Bible says every one of us shall know God. Even those who ignore him. Even those who say Don't, he doesn't exist. They know he exists. They are for a point of argument, they'll argue, but they know in every heart God has put eternity. The Bible says, everyone knows there's a day they are going to meet their maker. We have eternity reigning in our hearts. And so the Holy Spirit has come so that he can reveal to us the whole will so that we can understand the will. So Jesus, as a will, the will never came into force until the day Jesus actually was crucified and he died. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16, the Bible says, In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of one who, who made it because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is alive. So, my brother, my sister, let me tell you something about uh, this man, Jacob. Jacob knew everything that actually God spoke to him that was his blessing. He knew what he, actually God has said. God promised to take care of him, to feed him, to protect him. He knew exactly what God had said. And that's where his confidence came. Our confidence should come from when, actually, what did Jesus say is ours? Then did he die? If he died, then the will is in force. And if the will is in force, it's ours now to claim that which is ours and to make it our own experience in our own lives. And this is not something that you need. You need to be clear about this. You don't, don't allow sleep to your eyes until you know what is yours. Christianity is that understanding. The Bible says love God with all your heart, with all your mind. Loving God with your mind is knowing him. When people meet and they look at each other and they, they love each other and they say that is love at first sight, then they need also to know each other and then say, I know you now. And even as I know you, I love you more. Knowing somebody, understanding somebody, knowing God with all our mind, with all our mind, is going into scripture, understanding the word, and understanding what God has already done for us. And so a will was written. It's called the New Testament. It's called the New Covenant. It was written, and it's clear. And that New Covenant has the blessings it has the blessings that emerge out of the blessing of God upon our lives. Jesus Christ wrote the will. And so, and that's what a man will do before they go to meet their maker. They write a will. But that will means nothing. The attorney can stay with that piece of paper. It means nothing until the man dies. As long as he is alive, that will has no power. If you go to claim anything on that will, what they want is, can you give us a legal death certificate? Because when you bring that legal death certificate, it shows now from here, this man cannot speak for themselves. From here, what they wrote in the will is in full force and cannot be altered. So Jesus wrote the will, then also Jesus died. The proof of that is the blood he poured. 
And that blood that we plead is the license, it's the title deed, it's the insurance, it's the guarantees. It is, it is what actually is the signature on the check that we bring so that we can cash whatever is in the will. So whenever we plead the blood on anything, whenever we lay claim on something and plead the blood on it, we are signing, we are saying, I have a right to this. The one who gave me this is dead. And the one who gave me this is not changing his will. Now the other thing about Christ is, because when a man writes a will, he goes to an attorney and raises the will to an attorney. And this attorney is the guarantor. He's the one who makes sure that so and so received the money, such and such a bank released the money to such and such. The car went to so and so, the farm. So that is the guarantor. And he's the one that makes sure that the will is done. Now Jesus, because this will that he wrote, was so important, after he died, he rose again. And when he rose again, he is the guarantor. He is the mediator. He is the one who is making sure that what he paid for by the stripes, by his death, by his blood, he's the one that is making sure that we get it, that we receive it. All the wills that you know are always contested in court. Daddy loved me more than you. Daddy could not have written that. Daddy wrote that when he wasn't actually in the fullness of his mind. Daddy was conned into writing this. And so people go ahead and contest in the will. There's a court in heaven as we speak. It's seated right now. And that court actually, God is the judge. And the devil is always going there to accuse us and to steal what is ours in the will. Jesus is still our attorney. He's our guarantor, he's our attorney there, and he's the one that is fighting to make sure that what he paid for actually is ours and that we receive that which he died so that we can be established in this uh, new covenant. The blood is that evidence that the testator is dead. Every time we have communion. This is my blood in the new covenant. This is... My, this is the new covenant in my blood. He actually, while some versions actually express it that way. Every time we share communion, we are laying proof and saying, by this, by this cup we are declaring. By this cup we are showing proof. By this cup we are saying, everything in the New Testament is ours. By this blood, we are laying a signature and laying claim to that which is our inheritance. Jesus died so that we can have it. And so it is ours, and so we possess it. So communion is not something that we need to take lightly. Neither is it supposed to be taken casually. It is supposed to be something that we always actually do. And often, as often as we do it, it's a reminder to the enemy that this, actually, what we are claiming is actually ours. And we, need, we have a right to it, and it's ours. Okay? He's being alive for this reason. And you can read for yourself in Hebrews 9.15. The Bible says, for this reason... Christ is the mediator of the new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Hebrews 7.22 Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. He is the one who actually comes and uh, he is the one who enforces and makes sure that that is actually done. When the enemy goes to heaven to say that we cannot lay claim to it, Jesus is the one who actually appears there and as our attorney, all in white. The Bible says in Revelation that he's actually, all his hair is white. That means he's an expert in the law. He's the, our learned fellow. He's our advocate. And he appears in the courts of heaven. And when he comes there, he has no words. He just comes and shows his blood. He is the one who died, his blood is accepted, and he is also the one that is the guarantor of the new covenant. That's why the new covenant is a better covenant. The new covenant uh, actually, and the promises in it are better promises, but the more assured thing is that the guarantor of this covenant, the one who talks on our behalf, has already been proven perfect, and so he's actually fighting for us, cannot fail, and when he advocates for our case, it will not fail. The title deed that these things are delivered to us is the blood. If you know Jesus died, then you are sure and you know that actually he died for us and he died for our sins. When we plead this blood, it is like showing a title deed or proof that uh, what is written is actually ours. Now, let me take you to the New Testament and, and just go through a list of some things. Let me ask you a question. I know you are at home, and, but I'm sure you are hearing me. Are you interested in knowing what is yours? 
Because unless you are sure, the enemy will fight. He will contest. And that's why the Bible says without faith, it's impossible. Faith is the confidence. It's the assurance of the things we hope for. It's that confidence that what I hope for, I will get. Being sure, it's the evidence. That is what faith is. And it's built on this knowledge, knowing what is mine and knowing what is not mine. When I know what is mine and I know the blood of Jesus was poured for my sake, I can lay claim of it. And number one item is salvation. The new covenant gave us, number one, the blessing. The number one thing about the blessing is that it gives us salvation. There's no blessing without forgiveness of sin. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose uh, transgressions are forgiven, and whose sins cannot be counted for him or upon his case anymore, that God has already wiped out and cleaned. That's Psalm 32 verse 1. Blessed is that person whose sins are forgiven. But the first thing I want you to understand, Jesus came to give us and to afford us a salvation. It is saving us or removing from us the danger that we were in of dying and being burnt in hell forever. I've seen many people that actually are doing and have the things that you are aspiring for. Cars and houses and things and properties. It doesn't mean they are all blessed. Without salvation, without Christ, all the things that you own cannot be counted a blessing. It cannot be counted a blessing. There was the rich fool that was not blessed, but he was rich. There was the rich man in the days of Lazarus. He was not blessed, but he was rich. He had money, he had properties, he had possessions, but they come with a lot of sorrow. They come with a lot of pain. And I want you to understand, real blessing comes with those other things, but begins and has its core in salvation, knowing that your sins are forgiven and that your name is in the book of life. That is what Jesus came to give us as the first blessing. Now, what I've seen over the years is that we started out, uh, the church started out years ago as a very poor church that didn't understand the blessing, was just directed to heaven. And I think the enemy was just saying, you guys go to heaven, forget the things of the world. And now, when the church said, wait a minute, wait a minute, these things are ours. Our forefathers, we have the DNA of Abraham, we have the DNA of all these wonderful men, David, and none of them was as broke as we are. And so they said, let's wait and let's see what the Bible says. When they started understanding the blessing, the material blessing in scripture, they forgot salvation and then they ran after material blessing. I want you to understand, a blessed life is not just rich spiritually, a blessed life is also rich materially. A blessed life is not just rich materially, there's no blessing in just material things. The blessing is when the two collide in a life, that person is productive, that person has a testimony, that person knows that they are enjoying the fullness of the blessing of God. And if it was a choice, it's not a choice, but if it was a choice to pick one, I would pick salvation and I would run with that. But I thank God that I don't have to pick, pick and choose. I thank God because my blessing, the blessing of God comes as a package. Salvation is at the top, but all these other material things uh, come together with it. Amen? So blessed is a man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. If you read uh, about Jacob, let me read for you the generations of Jacob in Psalms 24 verse 3. The Bible says, Who may ascend into the holy hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Verse 5, he says, He shall receive blessing from the Lord. He shall, that man that is pure. In the Old Testament, they described it as going into God's holy hill. In the New Testament, we call it salvation. Who is this person? And he describes him, and then he says in verse 5, that man shall receive, or that woman shall receive, blessing for, from the Lord, and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. And he says, who is this person? He calls him the name, and he says, this is Jacob. He doesn't say that was Jacob years ago. He doesn't say that used to be Jacob. He says, this person that you are looking at is Jacob. And he says, the generation, that is the Jacob generation, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. 
And this is one of the things that I want you to identify with the life of Jacob. The confidence he had. The other thing that Jacob was a seeker of God. He was a seeker of God. He's a man, he's fighting with a stranger. He meets a stranger and I don't know what was going on in his head. He had sent his family, his wives, his children over across the brook and he was left alone. And a man appears. When a man, a stranger appears to you, you don't start fighting. I don't know what grabbed the hold of Jacob and he knew this is God and he started fighting with him and he started wrestling with God the whole night. He wrestled and fought with God. And in the morning, God said, you have to let me go. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Until you bless me. He's a wrestler. He's a person who fights. He's a seeker of God. He wants God with everything that he has. He is just coming out of a man, a man's house who worships idols. He has a relationship with this man, but he never accommodates the denomination or religion of this man. He lives worshiping his God. And he's still wrestling with God 21 years after he had departed from his father's house. This is a man that seeks after God. And we are told that these are the generations of Jacob. A man that seeks after the living God and who, whose life has not been transformed and changed by living in Syria. He's coming back as a worshiper. And we are told that these are the generations of those who seek him. And this is, uh, these are the ones who receive a blessing from the Lord. This is the Jacob generation. This is Jacob the generation of those who seek him. And so if you are going to be a blessed person, you are going to be one person that seeks after God. And I want to talk to some of you that have started enjoying the blessing of God. You have encountered God in ways that you didn't know were possible. The last 10 years of your life, God has blessed you. We Now you are no longer a student. Maybe you have settled in a profession. You have a, a little beautiful house and you have your own. You have a wife, you have a child or two and you are counting and you're just thanking God. And now God has started now becoming just, uh, just uh, you know, someone on the, on the side. You, you, you don't want to be bothered with these things that Pastor Kungo is always talking about. You don't want to go deep. You don't want to be sweating, worshiping God. You are now cool and now you have to even find another place where people that are dignified like you now can go. I want you to know that you will lose the blessing. You can stay with the money and the cars, but at the end of this journey, you know that you have lost one of the greatest things in life. If you walk away from the commitment to God, these men were wealthy. Abraham was wealthy. Isaac was wealthy. Jacob was wealthy. These men that were seekers of God, Job was wealthy. But this man sacrificed to God every single day of his life. He was committed. He had blood on his hands every single day, worshiping God, worshiping God, sacrificing to God. And this is something that I want to encourage you. If you really want the blessing of God, stay with God. Worship and serve him. As God blesses you more, just go lower and humble yourself. The more he blesses you, the lower you go. The more he pours your blessing, the lower you go. That even with all the riches and the wealth, you are still tender to the things of God. You can still pray in the spirit. Some of you are full of the spirit until you got money. When you got money, that now the Holy Spirit has been replaced by another money spirit. And so you cannot worship God now that you have been exalted. May God help us. May God help this church. May God help you as an individual, you family man, you wife. May God help you that you can still stay together. Some people cannot even live with their spouses when money comes to their home. The money is too much. Now I can get my own place. Now I can get my own things. And I want to just remind you that you will lose the blessing of God the moment you walk away from the foundation and that is the faith and the salvation that God has given to us. That is the foundation and that is what actually Jacob, Jacob was blessed and we know the secret of his blessing is that he was a seeker of God. This is the generation of Jacob. He was a seeker of God. The more God blesses me, the more I want to seek him. The more God blesses me, the more I want to serve him. There's nothing in this world that I cannot do in serving God. I will do, I will sweep, I will do whatever I need to do so that I can serve him. I will never outgrow my position in Christ and grow to beyond what God has given to me. I'll always be tender to the things of God and that's a commitment. Whenever God blesses my life, I made a determination long time ago when I preached in the village that wherever God takes me, I'm going to serve him and I will stay tender to the things of God. And I want to challenge you. If you want to experience the blessing of God and go for God to take you places, God has to know from you 
that you are going to serve him. Some people are saying, God, take me to the next level. God knows when he takes you to the next level, you are gone. When you have 10,000 in the account, you cannot even wake up on Sunday morning to worship God. Some of you are watching me from your bed. And that is not something that you ever did before. You never, actually every Sunday morning, you made a beeline to the church. God, can I get in this class? And whenever they called an altar call, you were up, on, up at, at the front wanting God to help you and stand with you. Now that you have some little cash, God is not important. I want you to know that God is all important. However wealthy you are, the blessing of God cannot stand and stay in your life. Unless, on the other hand, you know how to honor God with your life. Who shall stand in the holy hill? It is those who actually walk in the righteousness and uh, walk in the purity that God has. And I just want to just say, I want you to understand. I want to say these things in a dramatic way sometimes so that you can understand. I, if, if you have to be in bed, you, you, it's up to you and God. But that, that's not where you need to be when you are honoring God Almighty. When you worship even in your own house, kneel in that house that God gave you. Remember when you stayed in somebody else's place? Remember how painful it was and the promises you made saying, God, if you give me my own place in this country, if you settle me here, this is what I will do. You need to do that, that you can still struggle, that you can still wrestle with God, that you can still hold on to God and say, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, this man that is saying until you bless me, do you know how much wealth this man had? Do you know how much wealth Jacob had at this time? He had 11 children, so he's not looking for more babies. He had sheep, he had goats, he had ewes, he had everything that he needed in life. But he still wanted God in his life. Can we find a wrestler that will wrestle and fight with God and stand there and stand at the altar and say, God, it's you that I need in my life. It's you that I need to walk with in my life. That is the person actually that is blessed. So number one blessing is salvation. That is the number one primary blessing. If you miss everything else, don't miss that one. Because if you miss that one, you'll miss everything else. We've been made righteous. That is number two. Number two item is that we've been made the righteousness of God. It's not by my works. It's not by anything that I can do. I have now become the righteousness of God. And that is what the Bible says. We have our sins forgiven. We have our sins forgiven, 1 John 1, 9. What I have as a right is that I can go to God and confess my sins, and God is faithful and just to forgive me. So I'm blessed because if I make a mistake, and I do make mistakes, if I sin, and I do sin sometimes, when I, that happens, I don't do it intentionally, but I find sometimes myself, I'll find myself having done something that is wrong. I have an advocate with the Father. The Bible says in John 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. My blessing number three is that my sins are forgiven. My blessing number two, that I have become the righteousness of God. I did not just escape the fire of hell. But when they call saints, I can come up. When people try to show me what I did in the past, I can tell them, now that I'm in Christ, I have been, I have been given the righteousness of Christ. And when God sees me, he can only see Jesus and his blood upon my life. He cannot see my sins. So I have been declared righteous by God himself. Who are you to call me anything else? And so it doesn't really matter what people call you. I want you to know that you have been called, declared the righteousness of God. And some of you, uh, I know some of, some, some, I wasn't, you know, a saint before I got saved. I did my own kind of stuff. But there are people who come and tell you that because you did this, because you did this, uh, then you are actually not a saint. You cannot be fully forgiven. Some people will even come with some theologies that if you aborted, if you did this, if this happened in your life, if you ever went to Juju and did this, you cannot be forgiven. I want you to understand forgiveness and becoming righteous is something that we are guaranteed in the, co in the covenant and you need to have a confidence in that. That let the redeemed say that they are redeemed. That you need to be able every time people talk about Christ, you need to be able to say, by the way, I want you to know that I am born again. I am saved, born again. My name is in the book of life. I have a confidence that my name is there. And I know that if today Jesus comes back, I'm going to go home. My name is in the book of life. 
This is part of the wheel. Every time we share in the cup, this comes up in my mind that my sins are already forgiven. Whatever I did last week, whatever I did when I was young, it's covered in the blood. Jesus doesn't see it anymore. God doesn't see it. It's forgiven and covered in the blood. And as far as he says from the West, so are my sins removed from my life. Amen? So that is number three. Number four is the law has been fulfilled on my behalf. And I'm no longer a debtor to the law. Listen to Romans chapter 7. Read from verse 1 to chapter verse 6, but I'll read for you verse 6. But now we are released from the law. We are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way of the spirit, not in the old way of the written code. We are no longer debtors to the law. Jesus fulfilled everything of that covenant. And so what he did with that covenant is he went ahead and took the curses upon himself. Jesus could have been killed by just a sword. But he went to the tree, he took the curses upon himself and he said, in this law, I'll take the curses that are all in this law and I'll put them on myself and I'll take them away. So that the promises, the blessings can come upon the children that are going to come in the faith. So what he has done with the law is he has fulfilled it. I'm no longer a debtor to do the things that are there in that law. I am actually in Christ. And so I'm a debtor to do the things that are there. I'm required of me in Christ, but not those in the law. But what happens with the law is that all the promises, all the blessings in the law are mine. And the curses have been taken away. I'm not a partaker of any of those. So he says, now we are released from the law. So just being in Christ just being in Christ. Someone will not come and tell me about the Sabbath because I have a clearer understanding of the Sabbath. It was required in the law. It was part of the law, but Jesus fulfilled that law. And so when I'm in Christ, I'm married to Christ. I'm no longer married to the law. I died to the law according to Romans chapter 7 verse 4. I died to the law and so that I can be married to another and no one can be married to two people. So the law can require me, but I always answer to the law. I died with Christ on the cross. But now I've been raised with Christ so that I can live my life in the new covenant and not as per the old covenant. Amen? So the number, th number five is that the Holy Spirit will indwell us. This is the other promise. The Holy Spirit will indwell us, empower us, and remind us of our righteousness. In his name, he has given us his name. In his name, I can stand. In his name, I can live life. In his name... I can walk in power in his name. So Jesus has given us his name. And what he has done is he has said, okay, whenever they ask you anything, just say, I sent you. Just say, use my name. Use my name wherever because I give you my name and that name should mean something. Now, I'm, I'm, I, if I sent you to my own village where I come from, I'm not known, I'm not famous at all in my own village, but there are some quarters where I come from if I send you with my name and I say, when they ask you, tell them I sent you. And this is proof that I sent you. If you can convince them I sent you, at least you'll have access there. Now, what Jesus did is that he, he has a name that is above every name. And he gave us that name and he said, you can use this to stop demons. When they come, you tell them, in the name of Jesus. Don't honor me, but the name of Jesus. And they'll always obey and follow that name. So that is another blessing. The name, the Holy Spirit to indwell us. Before the Holy Spirit used to come. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon so and so. And he used to come and go. But on Christ, the Holy Spirit came and stayed. And when he went to heaven, he sent him. He's no longer coming out from heaven. And I always hear, you know, many times. And even new songs are being written about. Come from heaven, Holy Spirit. He came. Don't write songs about him coming. He already came. Not like in the day of Pentecost. He came like, he's never going to repeat the coming like on the day of the Pentecost. He's already here. Just receive him. He already came. Don't go into tallying meetings. They tallied for 10 days. And then the promise of the father came. From that day, we do not ask for him. We only receive him. We receive him. Receiving the Holy Spirit, that's what we talk about. Because it, the gift is ours and our children and those whom the Lord our God will call. 
He has given us also authority. He says, I give you authority over serpents as comp-. And this is where now confidence is needed. Use it. Use that authority. If you have authority and you don't use it, you lose it. Matthew 28, 19. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Luke 10, 19. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Mark 16, 17, and 18. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick. And will, these are things that we have been given authority to execute. So when I lay hands on a sick person, I'm not doubting. I don't make a big deal of it. I don't question the power. It's not in my power. And like the apostle said in Acts chapter 3, don't, don't look at us like in our own power, on our own ability, we have healed this man. It's the name. And in that name of Jesus, and faith in that name, that is having confidence that the name of Jesus will work. Having confidence and having assurance that this name will work. That is what has made this man whole. And that is what we lack in the church. It's not knowledge. People can quote these verses, but they have no confidence in these verses. And so we just have a few people who know how to use these verses. And then all they do, they even get to the place where they charge us to use these verses on our lives. Where all of us have the power to do it. Amen. And some people shamelessly use that and they do that. Well, it's not theirs. It's not their righteousness. It's not. And the Bible says clear. It's not somebody's righteousness. Jesus paid the price. Use the name. Now, when someone is, something is given to you in the will, you don't beg for it. You don't beg for it. If your father leaves you a house in the will you, and he's gone, you don't go begging for that house. When you show up, you show them one thing. You come with boldness and you say, this is mine. And they say, how? It used to be my father's. He gave it to me in the will. This is the death certificate. And this is, so anything that is in the New Testament that is ours, we can actually have it and enjoy it when we show proof that is the blood of Jesus. That we actually are confident and we know that he's gone. We know that thing is ours and we can stand by it. Number eight, pro- protection. Number nine, provision. Number ten, his presence. He has given us his presence. This is a blessing. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6. Let your conversations be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have for he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake you. And he has said, so that we may, so we, why is he saying this? He's saying this so that we may boldly say. When he says this, it's so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So when, when you know that he's with me, when I know that he walks with me, when I know that he actually is there standing with me, then I can boldly say, That the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Healing and well-being is also my portion. Dominion is my portion. Priesthood, deliverance, his mission, and all these other blessings. Victory over Satan and his demons. In Colossians 1.12, we also have been in Christ. And I'll take a few moments in this. We have been incorporated in the blessing of Abraham in the new covenant. So in the new covenant, one of the things that the new covenant has done, it has taken a Gentile, someone who had no claim, and made that person a heir of the blessing that was given to Abraham because the blessing of Abraham, the Bible says, was not annulled by the law. Coming of the law did not change the blessing of Abraham at all. So Galatians 3.17, what I mean is this. The law... Introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. The law did not. The law was established later. It did not wipe away the promise. The promise that was given and the covenant of Abraham has stood. But it stood for the Jews being in Christ actually allows me to go in and inherit all the blessings that are in Abraham's covenant. And I want you, I remember sharing with you here that the blessings, material blessings, are actually in the Abrahamic covenant. 
And we, we can also say they are in the New Testament. Through that New Testament, we get access to the Abrahamic blessing. Galatians 3.26, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That means you are inheritors. You have a portion. It's yours according to the promise. And having confidence in these things. A lot of people hear them, but it's those who mix faith with that word that actually end up enjoying the blessing. What are the Abrahamic blessings? What are these Abrahamic? In verse 14 of Galatians, the same chapter, verse 3, uh, verse 13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cast is everyone who is hung on a pole. So if I got to claim a blessing in the Old Testament and the curses show up, they have all been dealt with. The blessings are mine. The curse is not my portion. He redeemed us in order. Why did he redeem us? In order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. All the promises. And now that you belong to Christ, you are children, the true, true children of Abraham, you are heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. That is Galatians 3.29. So can I, I don't know whether I can say this enough times. Don't ignore the blessing of Abraham. It is yours. That's where your material blessings are. That's where you will be able to stand and claim. And when God created a man, he put two legs on us. He could have put three. He could have put one. God wants balance in our lives. And being able to stand on, on two legs and being able to stand there. Have you noticed? God is the one who created us, but he put kidneys in, two kidneys in us. We need one, but the other one is also important. If you can use both, you use both. But if you are left with one, you still survive. I want you to understand, this system speaks to us that even when you have two covenants, you take a hold of one and you walk with the spiritual side, you still survive. But to live in the fullness, you need both operating and working and working well. You, need, you don't need to relegate one to another life and to another system. That is yours. And if God gave it to you, you need to be able to stand in it. What are the blessings that were given to Abraham's seed? He was told, here he was told, you have to circumcise every male. So how did they enter into the covenant? They didn't just hear the words. They entered into this covenant by circumcision. Every male in their generations on the eighth day was circumcised. And that means everyone born of that male, everyone was blessed. Male or female, they were blessed because they entered into that covenant. And when that male also, actually when all the kids, male kids that were born there, when they were blessed and walking with God, because they were also circumcised, whatever they gave birth to also was blessed by God. That's how the blessing spread all among the children of Israel. But the entry point of that blessing was the circumcision. It was the way Abraham fulfilled the covenant. How God did his part of the covenant and brought his blood into it, he told Abraham, take for me these animals. Not for yourself, take for me, but for you. I want circumcision. That's where I want the blood. And the blood of these two is what sealed the covenant and that's what cut the covenant. And because of this, the Jews are confident because they know why we, they were circumcised on the eighth day. They know that this is what entered me into the covenant and that's where the confidence is. In our case, we enter into that covenant by the blood of Jesus, by salvation. That blood was poured. When we actually by faith receive that blood on ourselves, then we get circumcision of the heart and that's how we enter into the new covenant and that's how those blessings become ours. The angel of the Lord, in Genesis 22 verse 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and he said, I swear by myself. I'm not suggesting you start swearing. The Bible says we have no ability to swear. Neither by heaven, for it's... Uh, God's throne or by earth, it's his footstool. You, can, you cannot swear even by your hair. He says you cannot make one hair, black or white, you cannot. So he says you cannot swear at all. Let your yes be yes or your. But God himself, God himself, 
We know what he says is true. No one can question the word of God. But he swears and he says, by my swear, by myself, I swear. So when you hear God saying, I swear, it's no small thing. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. If you hear these words, God speaking to you, I swear to you so and so that I will bless you. I mean, that should give you confidence in life. Can now wake up and say, hi, well, if someone offers to give you something, you ask, well, what, what can you give me? I own the world. I have the sure word of God. God has sworn to me that he's going to bless me. And so the angel of the Lord said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand in the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions, possession of the cities of their enemies. And through, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And so this is a loaded blessing. The unpacking of it is right there in Deuteronomy 28, 3 to 13. I want you to hear this. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Amen? You, the fruit of your womb will be blessed. That is, your children are going to be blessed. And the crops of your land, the young of your livestock, the cows of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. So what, what he's telling them here, the, your business is farming. That's what you do for a living. And he's telling them, everything that you do, I'll make it productive. I'll make it multiply. When they bear, they'll bear twins. When they do this, they are, yeah, they are going to multiply. Your crops, yes, Philistines also plant crops like you. They plant the same because you're in the, the same zone, the weather is the same. So when you plant peas, they are going to plant peas. But this is the difference. Yours, when you put it in the ground, it will bear more. And when it bears more, I'll make that what they bear more valuable. You'll exchange it for more money. Or it will last you a longer time in your barns. I'll make it bless. I'll make it multiply. I'll make it useful. And its value to you is not going to be temporal. Its value will be permanent. So he's saying, I will bless your business. I'll bless what you do with your life. I'll bless your career. I'll bless you. And he says your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. That means even if you move out of this city and go to another one, I'll bless you there. Even if wherever you go, I'll be with you. I'll bless you there. Some people move from one place. They go to another. They think this is now suffering. If God takes you to a place, if God took me to Saudi Arabia today, if God took me to the desert itself today, I will still survive. I'll walk in the blessing. I'll walk in the power because this word here has taught me something about the blessing of God. In the city or out of the city. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you to, uh, will be defeated before you. They will come at you in one direction but free in seven. So seven means that they are going to free in all directions. Seven is complete. That they will plan themselves. They will come attacking you united. But when God actually speaks to them, he will scatter them in all different. And when you hear enemies here, don't just have people's faces. Also think bills. Think problems. Think challenges of life. These are things that they, when they will come to you and the enemy now has arranged them all together so that they are going to be your problem, God knows how to scatter them and put them small, you know, different directions so that you are able to tackle them one by one. The Lord will send a blessing on your balance, that is on your bank account, and on everything you put your hands to, that is on your job. The Lord, will, your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. So you come to this land here, God will bless you. God will work with you. You may have a 14-year period where you just got a wife and children, nothing else. But God will make the next seven years of your life multiply, bear much fruit. And God will open a new season for your life. It is the time Jacob woke up. And I think it is the mockery of Laban asking, heck, what can I do for you? Can I give you something? He had that mockery. Something stirred within him. And he got angry. He said, don't give me anything. Do not give me anything. I don't want to be given anything. This is what I want to do. And he set the terms, expanded him within seven years. He got everything that he needed. Verse 9, he says, the Lord will establish you as his holy people. And he has promised you on oath if you keep the commands of the Lord and walk in obedience. And he says, all the people of the earth will know. God was obligated to shield them from armies. He was obligated to ensure the land gave much 
obligated to multiply their herds, head of the nations. Have you, have you ever thought about this little nation called Israel, these Jews? And there is not a single, there were not enough armies to defeat them. That small town, it's small like a small village. But yet, big armies came after them. And when they came, God did something in nature. God did something among those who were coming against them. And they started killing each other. This nation could not be defeated. Yet, they did not have horses. They did not have chariots. These people did not fight the way other nations fought. God fought for them. Because he had said, Abraham, I will be your shield and your protector. I will fight for you and I will stand with you. This little nation was feared by all the nations of the world. Yet they had just come out of slavery for 400 years. Yet no nation on earth was going to shake them. Everyone was fearing. Everyone feared this nation of Israel. And everyone knew that this nation has a God. And you don't play or mess with the God of this nation. That is what God has always wanted for his covenant people. He gave them food. In, they're walking in the wilderness. Rocks are giving them water. I mean, if you said a tree or you said soil, maybe we can, but a rock, as dry as a rock, and the rock gives you water. God fed them all the way, in the way. God kept their clothes. Have you ever heard of a miracle where 40 years, your clothes, when you eat manna and you become bigger, your clothes expand with you. This is not spadex. This, are, this is skin. And they, they expand. When you actually stop eating too much, they, they shrink with you. When you get older and you get smaller, they come down with you. When your shoes need to get bigger, they get bigger. For 40 years, your grandfather's shoe is the one you wore. For 40 years, they had just the same clothing and that was supplied and used over the generations and God kept them for 40 years. And none of them needed extra clothes and they looked like God's people when they came out of the wilderness. A peculiar people. And that's what the Bible says, I'll make you a peculiar people. The blessing of God. Let me just indulge me for like two, three minutes in Psalms 112. Let me show you the portlet. How a blessed man looks like. Amen? I want you to hear this. One, one, two Psalms. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commands. You hear the blessing starts with fearing the Lord. Commands. Righteousness. Number two, he says, his offspring will be mighty in the land. The generations of their pride will be blessed. So when I read this, I don't want you to read too much into them. I want you to know this is what I need to look like. This is who I should look like. I may not be there now, but this is what God has already given me. So when I fight for my offspring, I'm not fighting outside of God's will. I'm fighting from a promised position. God has promised that my children will be mighty on the face of the earth. And so when I kneel down and ask for it, when I plead the blood of Jesus, I know what I'm saying because this is in the will for my life. God has said my children will be mighty on the earth. The generations of the applied will be blessed. So not just me, but my generations. He says, wealth and riches in his house and his righteousness endures forever. So you hear, same verse, wealth and riches and righteousness. I don't understand this kind of salvation where it's only righteousness or it's only wealth. Wealth and riches and righteousness are going to be found in the house of this man. Not in the spirit of this man. Not in the spiritual realms. In his material house. Wealth and riches are in his house. It is completely holy and righteous for a man or a woman of God to stand and claim the blessing of God. It is completely righteous to say, where I am is a blessing. I am thankful for it. But God, you have promised more and I claim more because that's what your promise is for my life. Now verse 4 he says, Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, he is merciful, he is righteous. So that is his demeanor. It is well with a man who deals generously and learns who conducts his affairs with justice. So let me tell you, a blessed man is not just somebody who can say, my account. It's someone who is generous. It's someone who is generous. God blesses you 
not so that you can increase and improve your, your standard of living, but also you can also improve your standard of giving. You are not blessed until your standard of giving goes higher. That's how you know blessing, the blessing of God has come upon your life. If you're still where you were before, there are some people God has tremendously given them properties and wealth and things. And they do not know that it is nothing and it will still disappear until you know how to honor God with that which he has given you. The problem is you look back one day and know that God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, the same shall he reap. He says here in verse 5, it is well with a man who deals generously and, and, and lands, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. So when you are actually blessed by God, you are not afraid of bad news. Bad news can come, but you are fortified in God. You are not anxious. You are not fearful. If bad news comes, it will find you, but it will find you with God. His heart is steady. He is not afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. So until people get angry with you, you're not yet blessed. Amen? The wicked man gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. I mean, they will see the blessing of God in your life until they say, what is this? I feel bad that so-and-so is doing this. Until the blessing of God makes them mad and makes them angry. And I just want you to know that that is the goal of God in your life. God wants his children to know the blessing and to walk in the power of that blessing. And that, that his will, that he, whatever he purchases for, for us, we can live and we can enjoy our life in that. And so the blessings itemized. I hope you wrote many down. If you didn't, we'll have them in, on the app and they're itemized so that you can know how to approach God and say, give this to me. So when you struggle and fight with God and when you do your wrestling matches at night with God, wrestle with him and tell him, I'm not letting you go until you show me how I can bring this and materialize it in my life so that it will be a blessing in my own life. I wanted to share some of these things to you so that the will of God can be established in your own life. The will, the will. When you say the will of God, I want you to understand what exactly you are talking about. He has left a will. In that will, it's written. Jesus himself is the one that is walking around in heaven with the will, saying, no, that one, they, let them drive whatever they are driving. Let them drive that because I paid for it. I paid for it. They are already in Abrahamic blessing. That blessing you promised Abraham, I already entered them into it. That is theirs. And the devil is saying, they don't deserve it. They just came to, became born again the other day. And, uh, they, and uh, they have not even served. They have not done, since quarantine, they have not. And God is saying, God, Jesus is there saying, you can say whatever you will, but you are not going to deprive them of the blessing of God because I paid the price and the full price of it has been paid. May God help you. And my prayer to you is that you can walk and experience that blessing